Shalom and welcome to Biblical Faith with Sam Peek. We invite you to join us as Sam brings a study in the Torah from the Jewish sages. And now our speaker, Sam Peek. Studying Jewish tradition, studying all kinds of, I hope, helpful things to you uh, that will assist you in your understanding of the biblical text and your understanding of Israel, uh, the Jews and Judaism and uh, as a Christian, and I'm quite aware that most of my audience is Christian, uh, to, this is also is to help you and aid you in your understanding of uh, the New Testament. And uh, I hope and pray that, that we do accomplish that here. Now, we are in a study, we, we just began it uh, a few programs ago, studying about the Aleph Beit, the alphabet, and uh, the Hebrew letters. Uh, we are only on the first letter, the first letter Aleph. And so let's walk to the board for just a minute and go ahead and put this letter up on the board where we can work back and forth here. We're still on the very first letter and that letter is Aleph. Uh, this will be our Aleph here, okay? We have a lot of things actually to say about it and to talk about it. First, while we're here, actually while we're here, to begin this lesson today, we actually need to, to uh, start with a particular individual because Aleph stands also for Adam, okay? Adam, Adam. You see how his name begins with this letter, Aleph. And uh, um, in fact, while we're here, let me go ahead and put these things up. Uh, let me go ahead and, and get these on. The reason, uh, the reason we want to, to bring the Aleph uh, to, uh, to Adam, to Adam, the first man, is, uh, is because in the book of Chronicles, now, now when I say in the book of Chronicles, I mean in the Hebrew text itself, okay? Uh, if we look at the Hebrew text of the book of Chronicles, the first book of Chronicles begins Adam. And the Aleph there is written very large. It is written like this. Uh, it, it will be a very, very, very large Aleph, uh, and then the, then the other letters are written normal, like so, okay? Why is, this, why is this Aleph written extremely large in the book of Chronicles? Well, oh, and oops, I made a huge mistake here. We have to give credit where credit is due, because it's not like, uh, okay, you know, uh, Sam is so sharp that he thinks up all these things by himself, no. We are using actually the research and in, uh, in, into the rabbis and, and into Kabbalah and into the Midrashim and into the Talmud from Rabbi, let's, let's put his name here, Rabbi Michael, Michael Monk, okay, is his last name. So let's make sure we give him credit because he is the one who has really done the vast majority of the research that we're going to be using in all of these programs that we talk about the Aleph Beit, the alphabet, okay. Anyway, the Zohar, the, 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 the book of the Kabbalah actually comes to tell us that the reason the Aleph in, in Adam's name in the book of Chronicles is written so large is, is it's to give us a message. It's to tell us that Adam was big. <laughs> Adam uh, was, was very, very great and, and admittedly so. In fact, you know, listen, think for just a moment. Listen, if... If the goal of the redemption, God's plan of redemption for us as, as human beings, as sons of Adam, all of us, whether we're Jews or whether we're non-Jews, if that goal of redemption is to bring us back to, to the point of God's original creation, when God looked at all the world and he looked at all the creatures uh, and, and he looked at man, he looked at Adam, Adam and Eve, and he said, this is very good. That is the whole point of all the redemption, to bring all of the creation of God back to the point where God can once again look at it and say, this is very good. If that is the case, then we must, we must say there was something about Adam. Uh, I, 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 I doubt very seriously that Adam is a, is, that Adam is a Neanderthal or a Cro-Magnon man or whatever they call them. Uh, I doubt very seriously if he is a if he is a an ape being. Uh, that just doesn't that just doesn't make any sense uh, according to the biblical text. Okay. Now I know some well, someone is going to write me a letter with all this proof and and everything, and uh, that's okay. 
But what we have to realize here is we are talking about the biblical text. We are not talking about all of these other things. We are talking about the biblical text. And in the biblical text, Adam is created perfect. Adam is created Betzalem Elohim, in the image of God. And we're going to talk about that a little more uh, as we go along here. And he is something. He is really something. So the Aleph, the beginning Aleph of the book of Chronicles, which begins to spell Adam's name, the reason it is so big, the Zohar comes and tells us, because it's a reflection, it's, it's to get across to us a message that Adam was perfect, that he was perfect in his greatness, that he was perfect in his majesty as really interesting. We come to the New Testament in the Gospel of Luke. And, and uh, both Matthew and uh, Luke, these two Gospels, trace some of the uh, history of the, of the lineage of the genealogy of Yeshua. And Luke goes all the way back to Adam. And it says, and Adam, who was the son of God. That's sure, of course. Very Jewish idea. Okay? So, Adam is something. Now, we want to go on and look at these three letters of his name. Let me erase this one right quick. Because these three letters of his name, if we write them this way, and this is a mem sophit, by the way, and it, it, it uh, has a different form when it comes further in the letter. Aleph is for Adam, is for Adam, and we'll just do it in English, okay? The human being, the human. Uh, Dalet, this letter, Dalet, is for a word in Hebrew called dibur. Dibur means the power of speech. And by the way, this is one of the things that sets mankind apart from all other. The final, the mem sophit, is for a word in Hebrew called ma'ase, ma'ase, which means the ability to, to do action, uh, to make things, the ability to create, the ability to work, uh, to put things together, uh, to take the creation of God and use it. Uh, all of these things come across in the name Adam, okay? All right. That, by the way, we can, we can work on this idea because uh, in the Talmud, in, a, in a, one of the tractates called Sanhedrin, uh, a very interesting story is given to us, uh, or information is given to us, about mankind in, uh, in general in the sense of individuals. Let me read it to you. It says, mankind began with only one person. That person is Adam. To teach us. Everything in the biblical text and everything in the oral Torah is all to teach us, to teach us something. And we should really be looking for these things as we go along. Well, that's one of the reasons we're doing this series. And by the way, let me, let me tell you now, uh, you know, someone will write me and say, oh, you've been on the, the letter Aleph for forever. Uh, go to something else for a change. Well, we will. We are going to go to all the individual letters. And so we'll be studying the Aleph Beit, the alphabet, for quite some time. But... I don't want to rush it to the extent that I leave out something that's really good for you. And, uh, and you're going to see that uh, as we study the letters, they are going to lead us into all different directions. In fact, Rabbi Monk, in his book, uh, The Wisdom in the Hebrew Alphabet, he talks about, he says, the holy letters, the sacred letters, as a guide to Jewish thought and Jewish deed. So you see what we have to learn here? Through the alphabet, we are going to learn how to think, how to act. And so this, this is going to be more important than, than maybe you think. Okay. Back to Sanhedrin. In Sanhedrin 37a in the Talmud, it says, Mankind began with only one person. That person was Adam. To teach us something very important. And what is that? The importance of every single individual man or woman. Every single individual person. In fact, the rabbis go on and say, Each person... Each single individual is a miniature world, is a miniature universe, each of them. As our sages taught, whoever destroys a single person destroys an entire world. And whoever sustains a single person, one person, sustains an entire world. Now, what are they meaning by that? They are actually meaning, number one, that uh, for your sake as an individual, 
the world is created and the world is maintained. Because in you is all the potential that was in the original Adam, that was in the ancestor of us all. In each and every one of us is this potential and is this really the opportunity for God to look at us and say, ah, this is very good. Uh, think of it in terms like that. Okay, now, when we go to Jewish tradition and, and some of the teachings of the rabbis, it's very interesting because they tell us that when Adam was created, the angels actually mistook him for God. The angels mistook him for a deity in some way. Uh, and there was absolutely no facet of creation uh, from the from the most simple and the most mundane to the most sublime and spiritual that Adam did not encompass. You know, there's a story in the Midrashim that says Adam was, you know, 600 feet tall, that his feet stood in the earth and his head was in the heavens. Well, are they meaning literally that he's a giant? No. They are meaning that in his, in his understanding and in his capacity uh, and in his potential, he encompassed everything in the entire universe. He understood all things. He, he, uh, he, he had this within him, this ability within him. And we saw in a previous study where, uh, on this subject where uh, Adam knew the letters. We know that he knew the letters because the, the, the sacred letters of the, of the Hebrew alphabet. And he knew the power of them and he knew the correct combinations of them. We know that because God comes and gives him a test. He gives him a test one day and, and ask Adam to put the letters in order that will actually name and represent every animal that was on. And there were a lot more animals then and, and, and creatures than there are now. Every possible animal that was on the earth. Uh, so very interesting and so very amazing exactly who he is. Uh, let's go back to the rabbis for a minute. When God asked him... Now, this is in Jewish tradition. God asked him to name himself. He replied, I should be called Adam because I come from Adama. Adama means the earth, the dust of the earth, okay? Uh, and so, in a sense, Adam gives himself his own name, according to Jewish tradition. And then God asked him, and what is my name? What should I be called? And Adam replied to him, for you it is fitting to be called Adam. Adonai, which also begins with an Aleph. You remember the first few lessons we've done on the Aleph is the Aleph is representative of God Himself. This very first letter, this letter that is one in the in numerology, uh, stands for the letter one, and it's it's Adonai also begins with this letter. Anyway, He says, "For you it is fitting to be called Adonai, which means my master or my lord, because you are the master of all." Even after his sin. Adam still remains Adam. Fallen, yes, but he still remains Adam. He is created Betselem Elohim. Betselem. Let's, let's, let's walk back because we need to look at this for just a moment. Betselem. And we'll do it in English. I know uh, Betselem. I know we say Elohim, but uh, we'll write it Elohim. That way we don't actually, even in English, write out this name of God. But Selim, what is this? What does this word mean? Well, it's translated for us into English in the image, in the image of God. Uh, but let's get a little bit better understanding. What is it exactly is that talking about? This word here, cell, is the root of the word, cell. And it actually means, it's the word that we get a shadow from. The word shadow, if you're in the cell of something, you're in its shadow. Okay, so what, what is it talking about? In the shadow of, of God. The best way to understand it is let's come to modern photography. If I am actually taking your picture with a camera, and uh, by the way, a camera is called matslema, which is still on this same root word, cell, in Hebrew, uh, which, which ought to give us an idea uh, of, of what it's talking about. If I am taking your picture, what am I really taking? I am taking the light that is being reflected off of you. I am actually taking your shadow in a sense. And it's in this way that we need to understand it. In this way, Betselem Elohim literally means a, photo, a photograph, a photo, a photograph of God Himself. Now that's very, very intensely interesting. 
What is, and that means not just a, not just a physical, it's, it's, it's really not physical because God is not a physical being, he's a spirit. It's talking about spiritually, spiritually Adam and what is in him is a photograph of what was a, of what, what God himself. Interesting, I, I think. Now, do I understand all of that? Of course not. Uh, of course I don't. But uh, it's, it's an interesting thing to, to add in here. Okay. You know, my biggest problem with any kind of series like this is, the, is as we go along, one thing connects to another and connects to another and connects to another, and all of a sudden I find myself, I find myself jumping, you know, in the middle of it and, and, uh, and getting off somewhere, and we've suddenly we've gone far away from where we need to be. So, uh, so give, me, give me time and, uh, and, and we'll get it all. I, I just surely pray that it is interesting to you. Okay, all right. In fact, back to our subject of Aleph and Adam, if we go to the writings of Rabbi uh, Shimshon, Samson Raphael Hirsch, who was a very, very great rabbi uh, back in the uh, 1800s, it's super good, he, he gives to us, he says, even after his sin, Adam remains Adam, created Betselem Elohim in the likeness of God, who is a being like God in that sense, God-like. Now you remember, way back when we were studying kosher, we saw that where they messed up is they tried to become as God. Not being like God, they were like God in their makeup, in their spiritual makeup, uh, and, and uh, in their ability to have a relationship with Him, and their ability to understand the universe and, and all of these things. So they, they, they are like God. Uh, the human race, the uh, human beings are like God in that sense. But never can we come and be as God where we make the decisions, where we don't follow His commandments, where we come and say, oh, well, that doesn't make sense. That's basically what Eve does in the garden. Well, it doesn't make sense what God told me. And she takes God's place. She becomes as God uh, instead of being like Him. Anyway, Rabbi Hirsch says, a God-like being who acts as God's representative on the earth. That's interesting. He goes on and he says, only man only Adam has the ability of recognizing and acting like, emulating, being like his creator. Thereby, in doing that, it brings godliness into the world. You know, that actually is, is really the mission, one of the missions that God gives to Israel. To bring godliness into the world. How? To act like him. To think like him. To, to do as he would do in every situation. All of those things. Very interesting. Now, let's walk again. It says, Rabbi Monk tells us, after Adam's fall, mankind sank into terrible darkness and idolatry and immorality for 20 generations. 20 generations from Adam to the next person we know from the Aleph. Oh, actually, we need to leave Adam's name up here. Let's, let me write it again. To the next person whose name actually also begins with an Aleph, his name is Avraham. Avraham, let me make sure I spell his name right. So this is Adam. This is Avraham. Abraham, if we have to make it into English. But you see his name also begins with the Aleph, just like Adam. Okay? Avraham. And Avraham is a unique person, just like Adam. Adam is unique. There is no one else like him, completely like him. By the way, every one of you who are listening to me right now, you also are unique. There is no one exactly like you. Uh, and uh, so, so all of these things are true in a sense of, of all of us in the human race. But Avraham is one. This is actually what the biblical text tells us. In Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 24, it actually says that. It's talking about inheriting the land. Avraham was one. In other words, he was just a single human being. But the word it uses is also the word that we use in Hebrew for a unique thing, a one of a kind. Avraham was one of a kind. So from Adam, this great person, 
who understood the alphabet, who understood how the universe is put together, who understood much more than I think we can imagine. From him to Abraham, 20 generations pass. And because of the sin of Adam, we have gone so far now that by the time of Abraham, no one believes in God. No one. Uh, the entire earth, the entire population is sunk into idolatry. It's sunk into actually unimaginable sin. If we were to describe them, uh, my ears would turn red. They are so embarrassing to even talk about. Uh, terrible, terrible situation. And then along comes Avraham. Now when we come to the Talmud, and in the, in the sages, actually it's going to be, no, it's going to be from the writing of the Rambam, okay, from Maimonides. He says, he says this about him, with Avraham began a new era in history. A new thing was fixing to happen, was beginning to happen. Though all of mankind was worshiping many, many gods, many, many idols, Avraham began his quest for the true God when he was only three years old. Now what's it talking about? We're going to find in a minute that Avraham doesn't really come to a complete and total understanding of who God actually is until he's 50 years old. But the rabbis, according to Jewish tradition, uh, according to the tradition of the rabbis that has been passed down from generation to generation, speak of Avraham beginning his quest for the one God when he was three years old. Let me read the story to you. Uh, they tell us, the Rambam tells us, he saw the sun rise and bathe the earth in light and activity. And Avraham thought to himself, even as three years old, this tells us something about who he was also, an extremely unique individual. He saw the sun rise and bathe the earth in light and activity, and Avraham thought, the sun must be God. Surely the sun must be God. But when the sun was banished by the moon, Avraham thought to himself, he says, well, now it seems that the moon must be God because it has overpowered the sun. But when the moon, too, disappeared, Avraham decided, even at three years old, he began to put together that there had to be something even over these two great lights, something supreme, something who, who, who was over them, a creator who made them both to work for him. A supreme God, a supreme one who, who made them both. Hashem is the one God, the Rambam says, who rules over all. I agree with him 10,000%. I pray you do too. They go on to tell us that Avraham reinstitutes. You remember Adam, when God said, what should I be called? He said, Adonai, uh, which also begins with the Aleph. Uh, Adonai, because you are the master of all. Well, in these 20 generations, that idea of God as being the master of all, the creator of all, the, the Lord of all the universe, had been lost. And it is reinstituted. You see, Abraham comes and reinstitutes, re, re, reestablishes many of the things that were lost in, in, in the generation of Adam with, with his sin and the decline of the human race. And he reinstitutes this idea of God who is Adon, Adonai, the Lord of all the universe. Uh, in fact, the rabbis say, even though Adam is the first one to name God this, uh, Avraham was the first to recognize that God retains his mastery over the creation. This, in other words, he just doesn't put everything into motion and then leave it alone. God is actively involved in the creation, uh, in, in the physical universe and in the spiritual universe too, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, minute by minute. If he's not involved in this, it would all come crashing down. That's the truth. Now, retains that God retains His mastery over creation despite the laws of nature that appear to be unchangeable and resistant to manipulation. God remains the master of nature. God can perform a miracle like this. He can reverse the decrees of nature. The Bible is full of this. Uh, even today, uh, He can do it all. Well, whether to tell you this story or not, yeah, let's tell you, because uh, even in the closing minutes of, of this program, where, where we're almost out of time, there was a rabbi, a great rabbi called the Vilna Gaon. Now, Vilna is in Lithuania. A Gaon means a genius. He was a great rabbi, and he, uh, a, a book came into his hand one time, uh, or actually in the morning prayers, Shacharit. Uh, this book was explaining, why do we pray, why do we sing this, the hymn, 
אדון עולם, אדון עולם אשר מרק בטרם כל יציר נברא, beautiful song uh, that you sing, and there are probably about a thousand different melodies, that you sing in Shacharit, the morning service. And this book came to explain that the reason is, is because this is what Avraham, this was Avraham's every morning, who in, in Avraham in Jewish tradition, he is the one who establishes the morning service prayer in Judaism. Uh, and this is something that Abraham sang every morning to God. Adon Olam, the master of the universe, who, who was king before he created everything. He was king. And after everything has ceased to be, he is king. He, he alone will remain. It's an amazing, amazing hymn and uh, a, a beautiful one. And the Vilna Gaon said, for this one inside alone, this book that this other Jew was trying to publish, we should publish his book just because of this insight that he tells us that, that Avraham, this, this idea comes from Avraham. Wow. Well, we're out of time. We, can, we don't have enough time to go anywhere else. So I'll spend the next few seconds just to tell you how much I appreciate you and how much I thank you for watching the program and how I'm praying very much that the series that we are doing on the Aleph Bait is beneficial to you. And that, uh, and that it is helping you learn. If nothing else, even, you know, I'm not trying to teach you Hebrew. That's not what, what we're doing here. Uh, we are trying to, to look at the sacred letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the first created thing in the universe, and learn from them insights into how we should think and how we should live. Because the letters of the Aleph Bet are in themselves a revelation of the one God, the King of the universe. I hope you enjoyed the program and come back with us again. I look forward to studying with you more and more. Shalom of to you. Peace and a blessing. Thank you for joining us in our study. If you enjoyed this study and are interested in learning more from the Torah and the sages of Israel, then check us out on the internet at www.bfm101.com or you may contact us toll free at 1-800-639-0169. Our mailing address is Biblical Faith, P.O. Box 2, Abilene, Texas, 79604. Until next time, we wish you Shalom Uvakah, peace and a blessing.